Have you ever wondered what makes an airplane fly? There are four forces acting on an airplane in flight. These forces are lift, weight, thrust, and drag. The study of these forces and their role in flight is known as aerodynamics. Let's take a look at how these forces work together to achieve straight and level, unaccelerated flight. This means that the airplane is not turning, climbing, descending, or changing airspeed. It should be fairly clear that before an airplane can fly, lift must be created. Lift is the upward force created by the effect of airflow as it passes over and under the wing. Weight is the force that opposes lift and is caused by the downward pull of gravity. Thrust, created by the power plant, propels the airplane forward through the air while drag, a retarding force, opposes thrust and limits the speed of the airplane. In unaccelerated flight, where thrust and drag are equal, the airplane will not speed up or slow down. Like thrust and drag, when lift and weight are equal, the airplane will not climb or descend. To help you understand lift, let's take a look at the basic principles of motion. In the 18th century, Daniel Bernoulli expanded on Sir Isaac Newton's laws of force and motion to describe the principle of airflow pressure differential. Observing what happened to air as it passed through a tube, Bernoulli discovered that as the velocity of a fluid or gas increases, its pressure decreases. He also found that with a constant velocity, the pressure of the air remains the same at both ends of the tube. If a constriction is placed in the middle of the tube, the same amount of air has to pass through a smaller area. This increases the velocity and decreases the pressure. If you were to replace the constriction with an airfoil, such as a wing, the same principle would still apply. As oncoming air meets the leading edge of the airfoil, it separates with part of the airflow going over the top and part going below. Since the air flowing over the top has farther to go, it must travel faster. The result is lower air pressure above the wing. This is a component of total lift. The remaining lift is provided by the downward-backward flow of air generated from the top surface of the wing. The lift provided by this flow can be explained by Newton's third law of motion, which states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The reaction to this downwash results in an upward force on the wing and an increase in total lift. Before we look at various airfoils and how they are configured to take advantage of the laws of motion and principles of lift, let's look at some of the terminology. A line drawn from the leading edge to the trailing edge of an airfoil is referred to as the cord line. The camber of an airfoil is the curve of its surface. On general aviation training aircraft, the upper camber is usually more pronounced than the lower camber. Any object moving through the air encounters a relative wind. This wind is always parallel to and opposite the flight path. The angle formed between the relative wind and the cord line is called the angle of attack. A way to measure lift as it relates to angle of attack is the mathematical expression, coefficient of lift, or CL, which is determined by wind tunnel tests and is based on the design of the airfoil. Each airplane has an angle of attack where maximum lift occurs. This point is known as CL max. Beyond this point, the airflow begins to separate from the wing surface, becoming so turbulent that the airfoil can no longer create lift. At this point, the wing is in a stalled condition. The amount of lift that a wing can produce depends on several factors. One of these factors is wing design, which includes the shape or plan form of the wing. A straight wing has good slow flight characteristics, but is not structurally efficient in terms of lift and drag. 
a swept back or delta wing is much better at higher speeds. The tapered wing, on the other hand, has good slow flight characteristics and has a relatively efficient design. Another wing design factor is the aspect ratio or the relationship between the wing's length and width. The aspect ratio can be found by dividing the wingspan by the average cord. In this example, the wing has an aspect ratio of 9. At a given angle of attack, the larger the aspect ratio, the less drag produced for the same amount of lift. General aviation training aircraft, for instance, normally have aspect ratios of 7 to 9, while gliders are usually between 20 and 30. Another design factor that affects a wing's flight characteristics is the angle of incidence. In this case, the wing is attached to the fuselage with the cord line inclined upward at a slight angle. You, as a pilot, can control lift by changing individually or in combination the airplane's airspeed, its angle of attack, and the wing configuration, such as lowering the flaps. If all other factors remain constant, doubling an airplane's airspeed develops four times more lift. This increase, however, is not without its drawbacks, since any increase in lift also results in an increase in drag. In addition, with all other factors remaining constant, an increase in angle of attack increases lift. For lift to remain constant, airspeed and angle of attack must be used in conjunction with each other. If airspeed increases, you must decrease angle of attack. Conversely, if you want to maintain the same amount of lift at a slower airspeed, you must increase the angle of attack. Another way of controlling lift is by changing the configuration of the wing. Lowering the flaps can increase the lifting efficiency of the wing and decrease the airspeed at which the airplane stalls. As flaps extend, they change both the camber and the cord line of the wing in the area of the flaps. This not only produces lower pressure above the wing due to the change of camber, but it also changes the wing's angle of attack. Suppose that with the flaps up, the angle of attack is 5 degrees. By lowering the flaps, which changes the cord line, the angle of attack increases to 10 degrees. This higher angle of attack provides more lift and more drag. Weight, like lift, is not a constant. It varies with the equipment installed in the airplane, the number of passengers, the amount of cargo, and the fuel load. During the course of a flight, the total weight of the airplane will decrease as fuel is consumed. In some specialized flight operations, such as crop dusting, firefighting, or skydiving, an additional reduction of total weight will occur. The forward acting force which opposes drag and propels the airplane is thrust. The same physical principles involved in the generation of lift apply when describing the force of thrust. The thrust necessary to overcome drag and propel the airplane through the air is produced by the power plant turning the propeller. If you look closely at a propeller, you will notice that it looks like a twisted airfoil. As the propeller turns, a lower pressure area is created in front of each rotating blade. The low pressure in front of the propeller, like that above the wing, provides lift which acts forward. This forward acting lift, or thrust, moves the airplane forward. During unaccelerated flight, where the airplane is neither increasing nor decreasing in airspeed, thrust and drag are equal. However, thrust may be increased by using the throttle to increase power. When you increase power, thrust will exceed drag, causing the airplane to accelerate. With this acceleration, however, there is a corresponding increase in drag. Drag will continue to increase until it is equal to thrust. When these two forces are in equilibrium, the airplane will stop accelerating and maintain the new higher airspeed. The force acting in the opposite direction to thrust is drag. There are two types of drag, parasite and induced. 
Parasite drag includes all the drag not directly related to the production of lift. It is generated by those areas of the airplane which disrupt the otherwise streamlined flow of air. These include items protruding into the airflow, such as the landing gear, rough surfaces, and the mixing of the air, such as where the wing joins the fuselage. As the speed of an airplane increases, the effects of parasite drag also increase. In contrast, induced drag is a direct byproduct of lift. It is greatest at slow speeds with a high angle of attack. Conversely, at higher speeds and at lower angles of attack, induced drag decreases. If the two drag curves are combined and the values added together, we can find a point where drag is at a minimum. This point is known as L over D max, which is where lift, when compared to drag, is at its greatest. In later sections, you will see that flying the airplane at this speed provides the best glide ratio and other performance benefits. The phenomenon known as ground effect occurs when the Earth's surface interferes with normal airflow patterns, thus causing a reduction in induced drag. During flight at altitudes, the downwash created by wingtip vortices causes the average relative wind to be inclined downward. Because lift acts perpendicular to the average relative wind, total lift is inclined aft by the same amount. The component of lift acting in a rearward direction is induced drag. As your airplane descends to within one wingspan of the ground, the wingtip vortices and resulting downwash are deflected horizontally. This in turn moves the average relative wind closer to the horizontal and the total lift vector closer to vertical, thus increasing the vertical component of lift and decreasing induced drag. As a result, the airplane tends to fly longer in ground effect or float down the runway. This can be a problem on shorter runways. Another problem occurs during takeoff where you may lift off in ground effect at a very slow airspeed. If your airplane hasn't accelerated to a safe climb speed, before climbing out of ground effect, the airplane could settle back to the runway. The information presented in this section has provided you with a fundamental knowledge of the forces at work on the airplane during straight and level, unaccelerated flight. The next section will expand your knowledge of what happens to the four basic forces during maneuvering flight. Throughout the years, aircraft engineers have worked to design airplanes which exhibit favorable stability characteristics. Stability can be defined as a design characteristic that causes an airplane to return to steady flight after being disturbed. In any discussion of stability, two kinds must be considered, static and dynamic. Static stability is the initial tendency displayed by an object after it is disturbed from equilibrium. Let's use a marble to demonstrate static stability. When the marble is resting at the bottom, it is in equilibrium. If it is disturbed, its initial tendency is to return to its original position. This tendency is referred to as positive static stability. How an object responds over time, as opposed to its initial reaction, is called dynamic stability. An airplane with both positive static and positive dynamic stability does not immediately return to its original attitude after displacement. Generally, it goes through a series of progressively smaller oscillations. Since an inherently stable platform is highly desirable, a training aircraft is normally designed to exhibit both positive static and dynamic stability. To understand how this is accomplished, we must look at stability in relation to the center of gravity and three axes of flight. Since an aircraft operates in a three-dimensional environment, aircraft movement takes place around one or more of the three axes of rotation. They are called the longitudinal, lateral, and vertical axes of flight. 
The common reference point for the three axes is the airplane's center of gravity, or CG, which is the theoretical point where the entire weight of the airplane is considered to be concentrated. Since all three axes pass through this point, you can say that the airplane always moves about its CG, regardless of which axis is involved. The ailerons, elevators, and rudder create aerodynamic forces which cause the airplane to rotate about the three axes. When an airplane is banked, it rolls about the longitudinal axis. For a right bank, you rotate the control wheel to the right. This moves the left aileron down and the right aileron up. A closer look at the outboard section of the left wing reveals that as the left aileron moves down, the angle of attack and the camber increase. This produces more lift on the left wing. Conversely, as the right aileron moves up, the angle of attack and the camber decrease, which produces less lift. This difference in lift between the left and right wings causes the airplane to roll about the longitudinal axis. This roll will continue until you return the control wheel to the neutral position. At this time, the lift created by the wings will again be balanced. The airplane will remain in a banked attitude until you move the control wheel to the left. This reverses the process and creates a roll back toward wings level. Moving the control wheel fore and aft moves the elevator or stabilator and creates a pitching movement around the lateral axis. When the control wheel is moved forward, an upward force is created on the elevator which pitches the nose down. Moving the control wheel aft will create a downward force on the elevator which in turn will cause the nose of the aircraft to pitch up. The swinging movement of the nose to the left and right is called yaw and occurs about the vertical axis. This rotation is controlled by the rudder. When you step on the right rudder pedal, for instance, the rudder deflects to the right, which creates an aerodynamic force to the left. This causes the nose of the airplane to yaw to the right. Keep in mind that the rudder is not used to turn an airplane in flight. Its primary function is to align the fuselage with the direction of flight. Now let's look at stability about the lateral axis, which is called longitudinal stability. Longitudinal stability is normally obtained by locating the center of gravity ahead of the center of pressure, which is the point along the wing cord where lift is concentrated. This creates a slight nose-heavy condition. To balance this condition, a tail down or nose up force is created by installing the horizontal stabilizer with a slightly negative angle of attack. If your airplane pitches up because of a gust of wind or momentary control deflection, the horizontal tail surface moves toward a neutral or slightly positive angle of attack. This decreases the tail down force, and because the nose heavy condition is no longer balanced, the nose will return to the trimmed condition. Similarly, if the airplane pitches nose down, the negative angle of attack, and in turn, the tail down force increases. This tends to return the airplane toward its trimmed attitude. Additional downward forces are imposed on the horizontal surfaces by the downwash created by the propeller and wings. This means that as you reduce power, the tail down force decreases, allowing the nose to pitch down. Conversely, when you add power, the tail down force increases and the nose tends to pitch up. Although a certain amount of pitch change with an increase or decrease in power is considered desirable, too much change would unnecessarily increase pilot workload. To help compensate for this, aircraft designers frequently raise the engine thrust line slightly above the center of gravity. This creates a nose-down pitching force when power is added and somewhat offsets the increase in tail-down force caused by additional downwash. Since pitch stability depends upon the difference in location between the center of gravity and the center of lift, the CG's location obviously plays an important role in how an airplane handles. 
by paying close attention to where and how much fuel, cargo, and people you load on an airplane, you can ensure that the center of gravity will remain within the limits set by the manufacturer. If too much weight is loaded in the front section of the airplane, the CG will be forward of the limit, making the airplane nose heavy. If this happens, there may not be enough elevator or stabilator force available to rotate the airplane for takeoff or to raise the nose of the airplane during the landing flare. A potentially worse situation occurs when an airplane is loaded with the CG aft of the approved range. In this case, the airplane will be very unstable in pitch. Even with full forward pressure on the control wheel, recovery from a stall might not be possible. Stability about the longitudinal axes is called lateral stability. Positive lateral stability is the tendency of an airplane to roll back toward a wings level attitude following displacement by a gust of wind or inadvertent control movement. The most common design feature used to attain positive lateral stability is wing dihedral, which is the upward angle of the wings with respect to the horizontal. When an airplane with wing dihedral is displaced in a roll, it will immediately begin to slip in the direction of the lower wing. This creates a higher angle of attack on the low wing, which in turn increases the lift on that wing, resulting in a tendency to roll the airplane back toward wings level. Stability about the yaw axis is referred to as directional stability. When an airplane yaws to the right or left, the large surface area that is behind the center of gravity acts like a big weather vane. This forces the nose of the airplane back toward the original position. So far, we have examined stability with respect to the axes of the airplane. Now let's take a look at some factors relating to the recovery from stalls and spins. It is important to remember that an airplane can stall at any attitude and any airspeed. However, there are other factors which can affect stall speed, such as weight and environmental conditions. As aircraft weight increases, more lift must be produced to support the increased weight. In order to maintain the same airspeed, a higher angle of attack is required to produce the lift necessary to support the increased weight, which in turn causes an increase in the aircraft's stall speed. How you distribute the weight also can have a significant impact on stall speed. For example, a forward CG shifts the balance of the airplane, causing a nose-heavy condition. To counteract this and balance the airplane, tail down force must be increased. You can do this by increasing the angle of attack, which causes an increase in tail down force, as well as a corresponding increase in lift and stall speed. Environmental factors such as snow, ice, or frost, which have accumulated on the surface of the wings, can also cause an increase in stall speed by altering the shape of the wing and disrupting the airflow over the wing. The additional weight and drag also causes an increase in the stall speed. Another environmental factor that can affect stall speed is turbulence. The rapid vertical gusts associated with turbulence can cause abrupt changes in the direction of the relative wind and can result in an increase in the angle of attack. Regardless of what causes a stall, you should be able to recognize the indications of an impending stall and take appropriate action to initiate a recovery before it occurs. Most modern airplanes are equipped with a stall warning device, which gives you a warning a few knots before a stall occurs. As the stall approaches, the flight controls will feel mushy. Just before the stall occurs, you will feel a buffeting or vibration. In addition, you may notice a pitching motion as well as a sensation of decreasing airspeed or a sinking feeling. To recover from a stall, lower the nose toward the horizon to decrease the angle of attack and regain lift. Simultaneously, smoothly apply maximum allowable power to minimize altitude loss and increase airspeed. As the airspeed recovers, you should maintain coordinated flight while adjusting power to a normal level. Keep in mind the reason you practice stalls is not to become proficient at stalling the airplane. 
Rather, it is to learn to recognize the signs of an impending stall and recover before the airplane reaches a fully stalled condition. The characteristic corkscrew flight path results from an uncoordinated stall where the aircraft's wings are unequally stalled. The three phases of a spin are incipient, fully developed, and recovery. The incipient spin is the portion of the stall when rotation begins to the moment when the spin has stabilized and the flight path is nearly vertical. At this point, the spin is fully developed. The final phase is spin recovery. To initiate the recovery, retard the throttle and neutralize the ailerons. Then, reference your turn coordinator to determine the direction of rotation and apply full rudder opposite the direction of the turn. Now you should briskly move the yoke forward to approximately the neutral position. Depending on the airplane, you may need to move the yoke to a full forward position. As the rotation stops, neutralize the rudder and gradually apply back pressure to return to level flight. During the recovery, you should pay close attention to your aircraft's airspeed and load limits. It's important to understand that, as an applicant for a private pilot certificate, you are not required to demonstrate flight proficiency in spin entries or spin recovery techniques. The emphasis in spin training is to provide you with an awareness of the conditions that could lead to an unintentional spin, as well as the general recovery procedures. Although aircraft may differ in design and performance, the aerodynamic forces acting on any maneuvering aircraft are basically the same. An understanding of the aerodynamics of maneuvering flight will help you develop the skill to perform precise maneuvers while operating your airplane within its design limitations. In straight and level unaccelerated flight, the forces acting on your airplane are in equilibrium. In a stabilized climb, the forces are also in equilibrium. However, the relationship between these forces is changed. When pitch is increased and the flight path is inclined, the force of weight is divided into two components. One component of weight opposes lift 90 degrees to the flight path, and another component acts in the same direction as drag, opposing thrust. Thrust also is divided into separate components, one which acts parallel to the flight path and the other which acts perpendicular to the flight path. The total thrust required is greater in a climb than in straight and level flight. Unless thrust is increased through an addition of power, airspeed will decrease as the pitch attitude increases. To maintain the airspeed, the transition from level flight to a climb normally requires a change in both pitch and power. Once pitch attitude is established and power is properly set, the airspeed and rate of climb will stabilize. During high power, low airspeed flight conditions, such as those present in a climb after takeoff, several forces can act to create a noticeable left turning tendency in propeller driven aircraft. One of the forces known as torque is simply Newton's third law at work. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. The force required to spin a propeller clockwise, as viewed from the cockpit, acts on the rest of the airframe as a force in the opposite direction. In other words, the airframe will rotate counterclockwise, or to the left, about the longitudinal axis. Gyroscopic precession also causes a left-turning tendency. The aircraft's propeller exhibits the same characteristics as a gyroscope, rigidity in space, and precession. Precession produces a left-turning tendency and is most noticeable when the nose is pitched down, such as when a conventional gear aircraft raises its tailwheel during the takeoff roll. As the nose of the aircraft pitches down, a force is applied to the top of the propeller arc. This results in a force exerted 90 degrees in the direction of the propeller's rotation and causes the aircraft to yaw to the left. Another left-turning tendency, known as asymmetrical thrust, or P-factor, 
is most pronounced when the engine is operating at a high power setting and the airplane is flown at a high angle of attack. When the propeller's plane of rotation is perpendicular to the relative wind, the ascending and descending propeller blades have equal angles of attack and produce equal amounts of thrust. As the airplane pitches to a high angle of attack, the descending blade of the propeller has a higher angle of attack than the ascending blade. The result is that more thrust is produced by the descending blade on the right side of the airplane, causing a turn to the left. Spiraling slipstream, which also produces a left turning tendency, is the result of the airflow behind the propeller moving rearward in a corkscrew motion around the fuselage. Since the propeller is rotating clockwise, the slipstream pushes the vertical stabilizer to the right, causing the nose of the airplane to yaw left. To help counteract left turning tendency and make the airplane easier to control, some manufacturers have incorporated special design features. One such feature is a small metal tab positioned on the trailing edge of the rudder. The tab is bent slightly to the left, so the pressure of the passing airflow pushes on the tab, forcing the rudder to the right. This creates a yawing moment, which counteracts the airplane's tendency to turn left. In stabilized descending flight, like a stabilized climb, the aerodynamic forces acting on the airplane are in equilibrium. However, during a descent, one component of weight acts perpendicular to the flight path, opposing lift, while the other acts forward along the flight path, adding to thrust and opposing drag. If the power setting is unchanged, airspeed increases as the nose is lowered in a descent, and a corresponding increase in parasite drag works to balance the force of weight. When airspeed stabilizes, aerodynamic forces are again in equilibrium. If the force of thrust is removed by reducing the power to idle, the forward component of weight must be increased to counteract the force of drag. In order to maintain the same airspeed, the nose must be lowered even further. In a gliding descent, the best glide angle and the best glide distance result from flying the airplane at an angle of attack which provides the least amount of total drag for the corresponding lift. This angle of attack is referred to as the maximum lift to drag ratio or LD max. The aircraft's best glide speed normally is achieved at the angle of attack corresponding to LD max. The best glide speed is published in the pilot's operating handbook. For example, the best glide speed for this airplane at 2,600 pounds is 75 knots with the propeller windmilling, flaps and gear up in calm wind conditions. Glide ratio represents the distance an airplane will travel forward without power in relation to altitude loss. For example, a glide ratio of 10 to 1 means an airplane will travel approximately 10,000 feet of horizontal distance for every 1,000 feet of altitude lost in a descent. The angle between the flight path and the horizon is called the glide angle. As drag increases, so does glide angle. For example, in a glide when the landing gear is lowered, there is a corresponding increase in drag. To maintain the same airspeed, this increase in drag is counteracted by lowering the nose of the airplane, thus increasing the glide angle, which results in a reduced glide distance. Although the weight of the airplane doesn't affect glide ratio, it does affect the airspeed that must be flown to attain the best glide distance. Since a heavier airplane will sink faster, a higher airspeed must be maintained to support the greater weight and yield the same glide distance as a lighter airplane. Turning flight introduces new concepts with respect to the aerodynamic forces acting on the airplane. In a bank, total lift is divided into two components. One acts vertically to oppose weight and the other acts horizontally to move the airplane in the direction of the turn. Since the vertical component of lift is reduced in a turn, to maintain altitude, you must apply back pressure on the yoke to increase the angle of attack until the vertical components of lift and weight are again equal. The horizontal component of lift creates centripetal force, which acts toward the center of rotation. During the turn, this center-seeking force works to oppose inertia, which is the tendency of the airplane to continue in a straight line. As the airplane enters a turn, the aileron on the inside of the turn is raised, and the aileron on the outside of the turn is lowered. The lowered aileron increases the angle of attack and produces more lift for that wing. 
Since induced drag is a byproduct of lift, the outside wing also produces more drag. This increase in drag causes a yawing tendency toward the outside of the turn known as adverse yaw. When you enter a turn, you should depress the rudder in the same direction of the turn to help compensate for adverse yaw. Once you are established in the turn, you may neutralize the ailerons to prevent further roll. Since the cause of adverse yaw is removed, rudder pressure also can be relaxed. When you roll out of the turn, you should apply coordinated aileron and rudder pressure in the opposite direction of the turn to return to a wings level attitude. During a turn, the outside wing travels faster than the inside wing and creates more lift, which may cause the airplane to continue rolling beyond the desired bank angle. You can correct this overbanking tendency by applying a small amount of aileron in the opposite direction of the turn. Two terms which are used to define the performance of an airplane in turning flight are rate of turn and radius of turn. Rate of turn is the amount of time for an airplane to turn a specified number of degrees. Every aircraft will turn at the same rate when flown at the same airspeed and angle of bank. If airspeed is increased and the angle of bank remains the same, the rate of turn will decrease. Conversely, a constant airspeed with an increased angle of bank will result in a faster rate of turn. The radius of turn, or the distance an aircraft must be flown to complete a turn, is also dependent on airspeed and angle of bank. For example, when airspeed is increased and the angle of bank remains the same, the radius of turn increases. However, if the airspeed remains the same and angle of bank is increased, the radius of turn is smaller. Load factor is the ratio of the load supported by the wings to the actual weight of the airplane. An airplane in straight and level unaccelerated flight has a load factor of one, which means the wings are supporting only the actual weight of the airplane and its contents. You may be more familiar with the term G-force, which is used to describe loads imposed on a maneuvering aircraft. You can relate G-force to the feeling you get while riding a roller coaster. As you enter a bank turn on a roller coaster, you feel the forces created by the combination of centripetal force and inertia as seat pressure. The pressure you feel is, in reality, an increase in load factor that is expressed in G's. As the roller coaster reaches the top of the track and begins a rapid descent, you may feel a sensation of weightlessness if centripetal force and inertia cancel each other out. It's important to note that a change in load factor can occur at any time due to pilot control input or environmental conditions such as turbulence. The amount of stress which an airplane can withstand before structural damage or failure occurs is called the limit load factor. Most general aviation aircraft are certificated in one of three categories, normal, utility, or acrobatic. Many general aviation airplanes are certificated in the normal category with a limit load factor of 3.8 positive Gs and 1.52 negative Gs, which is sufficient for basic training maneuvers. Airplanes which are certificated in the utility category have a limit load factor of 4.4 positive Gs and 1.76 negative Gs. Acrobatic airplanes are even less restricted with a limit load factor of 6 positive Gs and 3 negative Gs. Regardless of the category, it's very important to adhere to proper loading techniques and always fly within the limits listed in the pilot's operating handbook. Another way to avoid possible damage to your airplane by excess loads is to observe the design maneuvering airspeed, or VA. Related to stall speed, this is the maximum speed at which you can use full or abrupt control movements without overstressing the airframe. VA is normally not marked on the airspeed indicator since it varies with total weight. Maneuvering speed decreases with a decrease in weight because an airplane operating at a lighter weight is subject to more rapid acceleration from gusts and turbulence. If G loading increases while operating below maneuvering speed, your airplane will stall before the limit load factor is exceeded, thus avoiding potential damage to the airplane. Understanding the forces acting on your airplane will improve your ability to perform more complex maneuvers with greater accuracy and safety as you progress through your flight training.